Welcome to Litigation Nation. I'm your host, Jack Sanker. Today's story is Wisconsin medical providers go to the courts to prevent their at-will employees from being allowed to quit and work elsewhere. San Jose is introducing a new liability insurance requirement for gun owners, the first of its kind in the country. And Illinois biometric legislation has, in a roundabout way, shut down Facebook's facial recognition sector. All that and more, here's what you need to know. An interesting, though short-lived, dispute out of Wisconsin this past week. Seven employees from a company called ThetaCare, which is a healthcare system that operates in Wisconsin, wanted to leave their employment at ThetaCare to take a job with a competitor called Ascension. We'll get into the facts surrounding why they wanted to leave in a minute. ThetaCare responded to the imminent departure of its employees by filing for a temporary injunction to keep those employees from leaving. In its filing against Ascension, Fedicare asked specifically that the nurses be enjoined from starting their work at Ascension, and also that some number of them be ordered to continue to work for Fedicare, even though they'd already quit. Quoting from the Fedicare filing, quote, The court should issue a temporary restraining order and temporary injunction enjoining Ascension to either make available one invasive radiology technician and one registered nurse from the departing interventional radiology team members per day, or cease the hiring of departing IR team members until a time when ThetaCare has hired adequate staff to replace the departing IRC team members and maintain its level of service in support of public safety and health, unquote. So the request that ThetaCare made to the court was twofold. Order the nurses and radiology technician who had already quit to cover at least one shift every day, or and join them all from starting at Ascension altogether until an unforeseen time when ThetaCare could replace them, which, as the filing points out, could be some time since the entire reason ThetaCare was seeking to enjoin its workers from leaving was because of how difficult it would be to replace them in the first place. ThetaCare goes into all the reasons why its employees are so important to its practice, which I'll get into, and the relevant facts are long and complicated, but I've been through the filings of both Ascension, the new employer, and ThetaCare, the old employer. Um, and here are the points that I found to be most relevant. First, the nurses and technicians were employees of a level two trauma center at ThetaCare, which means it was constantly called upon to perform removal of blood clots, immobilization, catheter placement, and as ThetaCare alleges, is counted on each day to, quote, perform time-sensitive life-saving care for patients, unquote. Now, there's no reason to doubt that these nurses and technicians performed important jobs, by the way. That seems to be the case. Importantly, ThetaCare alleges to keep its level two trauma certification, ThetaCare must be able to provide 24-hour interventional radiology procedures, which is what these seven staffers that were seeking to leave normally did. According to ThetaCare, there is no other trauma center in the Fox River Valley that would be able to offer similar care if these employees were allowed to leave. Now, ThetaCare first learned that its employees wanted to leave on December 21st, 2021. The nurses and technicians gave their formal notice at various times, but the last one was on January 7th. Now, nonetheless, the employees agreed to collectively resign on January 21st, which was 14 days from the date the final employee gave notice, but recall that ThetaCare knew of their intention to leave as early as December 21st, so in effect, it had at least four weeks' notice, arguably only two weeks' notice, but it had plenty of notice. Now, ThetaCare alleges that COVID-related shortages had led to staffing shortages, which we all know about and it's been covered in the news quite a bit. It alleges that the lack of staffing could potentially lead to negative patient outcomes, including potentially death, And it also alleges that it could lose its level two accreditation if it cannot offer radiology services 24 hours a day. Now, importantly, ThetaCare did not even approach its employees about renegotiating their working conditions or wages until seven days before their agreed resignation date of January 21st. And on January 14th, whatever offers were made to the employees were deemed insufficient by those employees. After this, ThetaCare and Ascension met, and ThetaCare asked for 90 days of access to its former staff to work out a transition, which Ascension denied. And Ascension's response in opposition to the request for injunction opens with a great bit of legal writing, which I will share with you all now. Quote, your failure to prepare is not my personal emergency. 
this wry observation, a favorite of parents, teachers, coaches, and perhaps a few judges, concisely captures the core concept of personal responsibility most of us learned in childhood. Don't blame others for your own mistakes. Evidently, that concept is lost on Theta Care. With this frantic last minute lawsuit, Theta Care attempts to convert its own poor management into a disruptive personal emergency for everyone, anyone but itself. Ascension, this court, and worst of all, seven essential healthcare workers who, until Friday, believed that they were starting new jobs on Monday morning. Unquote. Lawyers for Ascension write later in the brief. Quote, Fetacare has only itself to blame for failing to maintain a competitive working environment for its medical staff, opting instead to underpay its essential workers and even refusing to make a matching offer to these employees when given ample opportunity to do so, unquote. The filing goes on to talk about how the parade of horribles that Fetacare alleges will befall patients is probably untrue. Quote, it seems Fetacare missed a second lesson of childhood, the story of a boy who cried wolf. Apparently, Theta Care hoped that if it moved quickly enough and prophesied sufficiently dire consequences, it could get an injunction or perhaps just force a settlement before anyone looked too closely at the merits. Its after hour court filings and its preemptive media release appear calculated to do just that. But that strategy is now backfiring, and then some, as the truth comes to light. That childhood story didn't end well for the boy, and this lawsuit shouldn't end well for Theta Care. Inventing an emergency and then blaming it on others is shameful behavior under any circumstances. To take advantage of pandemic conditions on top of that is disgraceful. Betacare has no legal leg to stand on, and the facts clearly support ascension. The court should deny the preliminary injunction, vacate the TRO, and leave Betacare on its own to fix the mess that it made, unquote. The brief and supporting affidavits filed by Ascension lay out the employee's version of the facts, which include allegations that ThetaCare never matched the offers made by Ascension, and made statements along the lines of, well, if we give you a raise, we'd have to give everyone a raise. So that was a dispute. There were multiple days of hearings on this, which took place during the week of January 17th through January 24th. The employees testified at these hearings. Many billable hours were generated, of course. The presiding judge eventually granted the injunction ordering that one technician and one nurse be made available to Theta Care, or that all seven workers be enjoined from starting their new jobs at Ascension until Theta Care could replace them. More motion practice ensued, and that order was subsequently lifted on Monday, January 24th. The workers missed their first day of work. No word on whether they will be paid for that or not. And presumably the legal fees will be taken care of by Ascension, though a GoFundMe was started and raised over $50,000 for their legal defense. So this case illustrates not only the intense nature of the current labor market, but it also demonstrates the new lengths to which employers may be willing to go to stop those forces. Again, it is clear that rather than match the offers its employees received from competitors, Betacare decided it would rather pay lawyers to sue and keep them from starting their new jobs. And while I'm sympathetic to the idea that patients may suffer because of a lack of staffing, ultimately that is fundamentally not the worker's problem. They didn't have a contract. They didn't own the practice. And obviously, were not valuable enough to pay what the market demanded in the eyes of Theta Care, at least. This case made national news in the past few weeks, not because the fate of seven healthcare employees was particularly captivating, but because legal observers are realizing this tactic could be deployed in other areas. Now, this could be a one off, but given the rising wages and tight labor market, it could also be a signifier of things to come. Up next, San Jose is now the first city in the country to mandate that gun owners have liability insurance for their firearms. This is from the San Jose Spotlight. On January 25th, 2022, the city council voted to approve new rules that would require San Jose residents to pay an annual $25 fee per household on top of purchasing liability insurance that covers, quote, any negligent or accidental use of the firearm, unquote. Within the next six months, the vote passed 10 to 1. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo said that the goal is to mitigate harm inflicted by gun violence and, quote, shift the financial burden of gun education and financial services to gun owners instead of all taxpayers, unquote. The $25 registration fee seems to be earmarked for mental health and crisis innovation services to be offered by San Jose, 
and will be administered by a nonprofit tasked with, quote, evidence-based solutions like suicide prevention, addiction services, and others. Now, opponents to this rule are obviously raising all of the counter arguments that you would already expect. Quote, I have a right to keep and bear arms as I see fit to protect myself and property. One resident said, a law-abiding citizen should not have to pay for this right, just like they don't have to pay or should not have to pay for First Amendment rights to speak, assemble, and worship freely, unquote. Responding to these criticisms, the mayor said, quote, there have been a lot of concerns about imposing fees and constitutional rights, and I can assure you there are already a lot of taxes upheld with the purchase of guns and ammunition. The question is whether or not there's a fee or an obstacle to exercise that right. And I believe this is not going to be a significant obstacle, unquote. Now, when I woke up this morning, today is January 27th, to check the news, I saw that the NRA had already sued over this regulation, as you might expect. Now, the attorney representing the National Association for Gun Rights, which is another pro-Second Amendment nonprofit organization, his name is Harmeet Dillon, said, quote, the fact that the city of San Jose is forcing citizens exercising a constitutional right to bear arms, particularly in their homes, and are taxing that and giving the tax money to nonprofits to then use it for speech that we all know is going to be used to criticize that very constitutional right, that is a violation of the First Amendment, Dylan said. In response, pro bono lawyers for San Jose responded, quote, the ordinance specifies that the money will not be used for litigation or for lobbying-related activities used by the nonprofit organization, said Tamira Prevost, a pro bono attorney representing the city. So that is one specific carve-out that has already been made. Now, it is a creative attempt at solving a small piece of the gun control problem. If there is insurance on firearms, then victims will have some avenue of recovery against insurance companies, rather than be on the hook for things like wages or medical bills, things like that. In this sense, the insurance requirement will function much the same way that auto insurance functions for car accident cases. Nonetheless, I think this will be the start to a very long and contentious litigation of this ordinance. Facebook is shutting down its facial recognition system after years of litigation stemming from privacy laws passed in Illinois and in other states. The company says it is limiting the use of facial recognition due to growing societal concerns and an unclear regulatory landscape surrounding the use of the technology. This is from a Reuters report, quote, Facebook's decision comes after it settled a major class action in February 2021 that alleged the company's facial recognition system violates Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA. BIPA provides a private right of action to Illinois residents aggrieved by private entities that collect their biometric data, which includes retina scans, fingerprints, face geometry, without complying with the statute's notice and consent requirements. BIPA allows per violation statutory damages of $1,000 for negligent and $5,000 for reckless or intentional violations of the law. The class of Illinois residents was estimated to consist of approximately 6 million users for whom Facebook's algorithm stored a digital face template based on their facial geometry, making the total potential value of the class claims estimated at between $10 billion and $47 billion. Several rulings preceding the settlement shed light on why Facebook is likely abandoning this technology now. In 2019, for example, Facebook paid a $5 billion settlement to the FTC after the agency complained that Facebook violated privacy provisions by misrepresenting the extent to which users could control the privacy of their facial recognition, including the fact that about 60 million users were automatically enrolled unless they opted out. Now, Prior rulings in the class action claims held that BIPA vested in Illinois residents the right to control their biometric information by requiring notice before collection and the ability to withhold consent, which codified a right of privacy and personal biometric information. Now, I am speculating here, but the notice and consent requirements here would likely make Facebook's model, which relies generally on the passive collection of data from unknowing participants, untenable. 
So this and other rulings have been applied in the class action contest for many tech companies recently, resulting in BIPA settlements with other tech companies as well as some non-tech companies. After Facebook's record $650 million settlement, other defendants have followed suit and cut deals in 2021, including settlements by TikTok for $92 million, but also Six Flags for $36 million, Shutterfly for $6.75 million, which makes sense, but then Wendy's settled for $5.85 million. I don't know where that would have came from, among others. Commentators have pointed out that BIPA litigation is one of the hottest new class action trends, and now other states are considering adopting their own version of the Illinois legislation. This is from David Oberly in Law 360. Quote, taking note of the increased commercial use of biometric technologies today, lawmakers in Kentucky started out the 2022 legislative session with the introduction of House Bill 32, a carbon copy of Illinois' BIPA. If enacted, Kentucky's BIPA copycat bill would bring with it an avalanche of class actions similar to those companies have been facing in connection with Illinois' biometric privacy statute. And from a broader perspective, if successful, House Bill 32 would likely generate further momentum for other states and cities to enact similar biometric laws of their own. Oberly writes, quote, the trend towards favoring private right of action provisions over administrative enforcement by both state and municipal legislatures is gaining momentum and should be cause for concern for those entities that use biometrics where no targeted biometric privacy laws currently exist. More on that is only a matter of time before biometric privacy laws are the norm and not the exception across the country, unquote. Now, you never really want to bet against big tech, but Illinois' BIPA legislation is commonly described as the toughest data security law on the books in the U.S., and if it becomes more common, companies like Facebook and Google and I guess Six Flags and Wendy's, which apparently rely on the free data of non-consenting users in exchange for free use of Google and Facebook search and social networking services and whatever it is that Wendy's and Six Flags are up to, they will have to adapt. Now, I should note that there is interesting federal legislation being kicked around Washington right now, which, believe it or not, has some bipartisan support. Regardless, the landscape of free collection of data seems to be changing with respect to big tech's collection practices, one way or the other. That's a wrap, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope you're enjoying it so far. You'll note that we aren't covering the retirement of Justice Breyer because, as I've said, there are plenty of other Supreme Court-centered podcasts out there that can do it better. And our goal here is to get a little deeper into the big headlines rather than just repeat the same talking points that you would get anywhere else. But I wanted to note that, yes, we noticed he retired. As always, if you like the show, drop a rating on Apple Podcasts. That really helps us out. If you have a question or want us to cover something, leave a review with your comment or question, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.